Luke, great to have you back again. And let's start with one of the biggest topics of the week, and this is a big biosecurity threat to Australia's cattle industry. How big an issue is this for the cattle industry there? Yeah, good morning, guys. It's the issue that propped up probably earlier at the start of the week, which is the re-emergence of foot and mouth disease in Indonesia. Um, this is the first outbreak that's been detected in Indonesia since 1986, so it's a pretty significant time. Now, before we go any further into it, it's probably worth saying this is not the same disease as hand, foot and mouth, which is a common infection in uh, children. This is foot and mouth, which affects cloven hoofed animals. So it's not just cattle. Cattle are a big concern. Cattle are where it's popped up in Indonesia, but it also can affect sheep, um, deer, pigs, and it actually, that we believe, has come to Indonesia from goats that were smuggled in, in Malaysia, according to early reports. So this is going to be a, a pretty serious issue if, if it does manage to get into Australia, to paint a picture of what that looks like, because obviously we talk about diseases uh, a lot at the moment, given that we've just come out of the pandemic or are still in, depending uh, on sort of perspective on things. If this got into Australia and it was a 12-month outbreak, it could cost $16 billion dollars in terms of an early estimate. If this got into Australia and it was a multi-year outbreak, it could cost up to $50 billion to mm. the entire livestock mm. agricultural industry. It's a huge risk and it's got a lot of people uh, in, in the industry very nervous. We've been talking about lumpy skin disease, which is another disease that popped up actually in Indonesia recently uh, for the past month or so. But now uh, with foot and mouth re-emerging, they had uh, a thousand detected cases. It's across um, a series of provinces and has potentially spread much further. So there's a lot of fear right now that if that does get into the Australian industry, it could cause pretty dramatic problems. And, and the timing couldn't be worse, quite frankly, because we've just come out of um, a, a tough time for the livestock industry. I mean, we've had drought in large parts of the country for a long time. The national herd rebuild is underway. We've got great prices for Australian beef. It's a good time right now for, for most um, livestock producers across the country. So if this came and got in now, uh, it would be a pretty serious concern. Now, look, we often hear about the supermarket milk price wars and the, what the prices mean for consumers, but how's it tracking from the farmer's perspective? Well, this is really interesting because there's been a lot of change in this sector in the last couple of years. So three years ago, the ACCC brought in uh, a new set of rules for the dairy processes uh, in re response to the dollar a litre milk war, which we all know and are very familiar with um, from back in the days. So essentially, uh, now processors have to do a few things, including declaring their price at the start of the season. Uh, the start of the season is June the 1st. What we do tend to see now is that a lot of processors come out early. So to give you an idea, um, milk prices for farmers are done on something called a per kilo milk salt, which is how much protein and fat uh, is in the milk. And last year, when we were looking at prices, they started around sort of $6.80 or so per kilo milk solids, which was pretty good. Most farmers are pretty happy with that. This year, the prices we've seen so far, Fonterra, which is one of the largest processors, a New Zealand-based company, works with a lot of dairy farmers across Australia, opened at $8.25. Vega Cheese, obviously, and dairy opened at $8.40. Uh, and Buller also opened at around $7.40 as well at the moment. Now, obviously, we haven't got to June 1st, so those prices haven't actually officially started. But at the same time, um, it's a massive step up, and it's well needed as well for the dairy industry right now because... Something we're facing across all agriculture right now is a rise in input costs, which means that it's pretty much more expensive just to go about the business of farming. The cost of fertiliser has gone through the roof, particularly with the Russian and Ukrainian crisis, and it was already going that way before. Chemical prices are up, feed prices are up as a result. So it's a very expensive time to be a farmer in Australia at the moment. So we need, or they need, I should say, these prices to be competitive. Now, Luke, uh, last time we spoke to you, we spoke about a big giant pumpkin. This time it's a big giant pile of wool, all from the one sheep, because it missed shearing for many years. How many years? It did. Um, I can't remember exactly how many, I think it was sort of seven. five or, or six. It was seven years. Seven years, years. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad to say you've got the data on hand, but still a massive time. This sheep has literally just been called big sheep over in WA, 22 kilograms of wool. 22 kilograms of fleece on this. The average merino fleece is around sort of 4.5 kilos. So um, significantly, significantly larger. That being said, not the largest ever. Mm. Um, you might remember back in 2004, actually. I, mean, I remember reading this as a, a kid. A, a, must have been year one or two or something. Shrek the sheep in New Zealand. Mm. It was 27 kilograms and had been lost. But actually, the record is an Australian sheep called Chris from the ACT who was 
41 kilograms when he was found. So this is a big, big sheep, but not quite up to, to Chris's level. Of I really feel for the sheep because it can't be comfortable um, or good for their bodies and their well-being to carry around that load. Thankfully, this sheep has now joined the rest of its group um, after this big ordeal. And I read also that the wool will be going to some people who like to do spinning because the longer wool is better for them. Yeah, so the, the thing about a fleece this size is the, the length of the actual fibre is so long that it can't really be used for production, which is a common thing they talk about whenever they find one of these big sheep. Okay. Um, interesting fact on this is that they, these sheep almost always are wetters, so castrated male sheep. So they, yeah. they tend to um, be pushed out onto the rougher bush paddocks, um, you know, parts of the farm that are uh, a little bit harsher. So, of course, if you've got a lot of bush paddock and then you disappear, <laughs> They, they get lost, they go for a wander. Um, so it's quite common to find them that you might have missed for a year or two. Um, but yeah, finding one that's been missing for seven years is quite a long period of time. A pretty so, long period, yeah. Hopefully he's having a happier life now. Luke, always good to have you on. Thanks very much. Pleasure to be here. Thanks, guys.